Brother Benny, you're already up. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for allowing us to come into your house this morning and hear your word and, and just marvel at, at, at your words and, and how you are allowing us in, in a very difficult time to, to even come to your house and enjoy it. Lord, we ask you to pray for our country and just meet with our leaders and, and let's try to get our country back and bring our country back to you, God. And please forgive us for the failure. We ask your son, our bishop, Lord, name. Amen. 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 Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, who's visiting for the very first time? Anybody? Okay. Well, tell us who you are and where you're from. This is my wife, Faye. I'm Danny. I'm from Bass, and we uh, live in Carolina Shores. We just retired down here the first of the year. We're from Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, we're glad to have you. Well, we just playing over here. We're dancing somebody. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> we might as well say she's a visitor. Well, she is a visitor. So I don't think it's her first time. I have not moved my letter yet. <laughs> All right. Well, well, do we have any announcements we need to make this morning? Anybody? Good morning, everyone. I have a card I'd like to read to you. It says, just think, you're not here by chance, but by God's choosing. His hand formed you and made you the person you are. He handpicked you to be the mother your family needs. You lack nothing that his grace can't give you. You are one of a kind. He compares you to no one else. <clears throat> Through you, he is fulfilling his special purpose for this generation and for generations to come. To all the wonderful mothers of care ministry, thanking God for all the beautiful ways he is working in you and through you to bring his love to life. God bless you all. In Christ Jesus, James Dugan. You may not recognize that name. He is one of the guys that's in the prison that we are ministering to through our care ministry. And he has sent us a check for $100. And so we just want to continue to ask the Lord's blessings upon him. Amen. Then there's a couple more important announcements need to make uh, concerning our Sunday school hour for all the adults. We have teachers lined up for our sanctuary for the remainder of May, but beginning in June, we're going to go back to classrooms. And so keep that in mind for all the adults. The children and youth are already in their classrooms, but the adults will go back to their classrooms uh, at the appointed time, which will be the first week in June. Also, on June the 9th, in our next business meeting, we're going to be taking nominations for deacon. So please be praying about that, that the Lord lays upon your heart uh, the desire, his desire, for the next deacon of our church to join the other deacons. Any other announcements? Oh, I'm So, hey, Frank. Um, <laughs> if you didn't know, fun fact, this upcoming Friday, I have the honor of graduating. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> so, the next day, Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, May 22nd, if you want to celebrate with us, you just come right back here. Two days in the weekend, why not, you know? Um, it's at 1, from 1 to 4. You can just hop in when you want. Food will be provided. You guys are all more than welcome to be here and celebrate with us. So that is this upcoming Saturday, May 22nd, from 1 to 4. Thank you. Does it seem like it's a long time coming? Yes, it's a long time. Congratulations. Any other announcements? If not, have we had any birthdays? There's one coming, I think. Well, I don't have to tell everybody. Come back here, tell everybody how I am. Ancient. Eighty-one. 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 Eighty
hope I'm in that kind of state when I'm 81. Hey. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Any birthday? If not, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All the next All the next one. All the Oh, the anniversary. Oh, yeah. 29 glorious years. <laughs>
Appreciate you being here as well. And also, uh, for those that are in our sanctuary, we have some in the fellowship hall. I want to thank God for all of you that's arrived here today. Ruth chapter 2 is where we're headed. Ruth chapter 2. The provision of God is what we'll be speaking on in Ruth chapter 2. We're going to look at the whole chapter of verses 1 through 23. We're simply picking up where we left off last week in our Mother's Day message of Naomi and Ruth. And so today, we're going to look at another chapter, and may the Lord bless us and give us what we need for this day. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. Our Heavenly Father, as we are looking for our places, and as we are bowing our heads in prayer, and as we are thanking you for this week's blessings, we pray that you would bless uh, this week uh, that is coming for everything that we go through or going to. I pray that you'll bless our steps, bless our travels. Uh, for those who have gathered here today and many needs has been represented, we've already prayed about them. Pray, Lord, you would have your way to every person's individual lives. Now, as we consider our time together in your holy and precious word, I pray that you would lead us and guide us in all spiritual truth. I pray that you would show us what we need for our spiritual lives, for us as individuals, and then collectively as a church body. We want to give you the glory and the praise in everything that you've done. And Father, we can already say we've been blessed. The choir's music, the singing, 
We thank you for that. And now as we turn our attention to your holy and precious word, give us what we need for this day. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you remember in our previous message in the book of Ruth, uh, we saw several things that were highlighted. One of the things that was highlighted was a famine that had come into the land. And uh, what was interesting is that it came to the land of Bethlehem, Judah. And that means the house of bread and house of praise, and yet there was a famine to come to it. As a result of the famine, one man took his family away from the house of bread and house of praise and went out to God's wash pot. His name is Elimelech. His wife's Naomi, they had two sons, Melon and Chilion. And so by their leaving, they showed an extreme unbelief in the power of God to see them through the famine. They also showed backsliding on their part. Uh, they began getting involved with the things of the world, and instead of being close to God, they began to get close to the things of the world. We also saw <clears throat> the death of Elimelech. <coughs> And his, uh, his and Naomi's son's marriages to two women of the Moabites, Orpha and Ruth. And that shows us they had a total disregard for the word of God. Because the Bible clearly taught in the Old Testament times they were not partake of any wives or any spouses outside the Israelite nation. Because, and the reason was because they will lead you away from God and they will uh, have you to perform worship to false idols. Then we saw the death of Naomi's two sons, Malon and Chilion. Then we saw Naomi had an urge, had a, a, a spirit filled, I believe, belief to get back to the house of bread and house of praise. There was nothing left for her to stay in Moab. And so she decided she would go back and try to persuade her daughters-in-law to stay. Say, if you go back with me, there's nothing there for you because the Israelite men are not going to have anything to do with you. And you'll be poor, you'll be widowed, and you'll never have children the rest of your lives. When I spoke to Orphan, she began to think about it, and so she decided to stay. But Ruth was determined to stay with Naomi. And when Naomi tried to persuade her father, we noticed the decision that Ruth made uh, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Listen to what she says. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And so we see that there is a strong bond between these two women. In chapter 1 of Ruth, we saw that Naomi was the main character. And that she was the one that was emphasized. In chapter 2, we're going to see that Ruth now becomes the main character. And what is going to be emphasized is the relationship that begins to build between her and and a man called Boaz. What is noticeable throughout the book of Ruth is the love that Ruth has for Naomi and the love that Naomi has for Ruth. We see in Ruth's choice to go and stay with Naomi to let her people be her people, the land that she loves to be her land, but most importantly, her God become her God as well. And so we saw that in chapter 1, but we're going to see it play out as well in chapter 2, as Ruth will continue in lowly service to help provide food for both of them and trust God in his providence. Chapter 1 leaves us feeling sad. Naomi's lost everything. She's lost her husband. She's lost both her sons. She's now a poor widow, has no way to make it. And we, we, we realize that she has become bitter. That's through her own words. I went out full. I'm coming back to the land of praise, the land of bread. I'm coming back empty. God has dealt with me very harshly. So she's no longer pleasant, but it's become bitter. Both her and Ruth now are widows. Both of them are without children. 
Their greatest need in society in that day was to be able to uh, gather food, to have food for the family, but also to have family in itself. Concerning the famine that had happened, but now God had opened up the windows of blessing upon the land of Bethlehem, Judah, and now they were beginning to harvest what they had sowed a few months earlier. Harvest time is when the community would come together and they would express joy, they would express thankfulness for the blessings of God and giving them plenty of food to provide for them throughout the year. You see, uh, as we come to chapter 2, we're going to see a new beginning, not only for Naomi, but for Ruth as well. We're going to see that Naomi will turn from bitterness into pleasantness once again. She'll be full of gladness. And Ruth, she's going to see her go from the bottom of the rung in society to what they held for women who are widowed, and especially a stranger, a foreigner, and we're going to see her ri rise up to be one that will be well respected, one that will be honored, and one that will trust in the Lord with all of her heart. She is truly a woman of great character. All that our girls and our young women would model themselves after this woman called Ruth. All that our young men, our boys would model themselves after this man called Boaz, we're going to begin to know. Let's look in verse 1. Now it came to pass, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 1, chapter 2. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So here we are introduced to a man called Boaz, who the Bible relates is a relative of Naomi through Elimelech, her husband. We are told that several things about this man called Boaz, and they are emphasized to us. First of all, he is a mighty man. What does that mean? It means he's a man in good standing with the community. He's well thought of. He has a good moral character. He's a leader in the community. He's a godly man. He's what we would call a knight in shining armor. He was what every woman dreamed for a husband. Not only was he a mighty man, but the Bible says he was a mighty man of wealth. He was one who God had blessed tremendously and had accumulated riches and great wealth. But notice what is also said. He is of the family of Elimelech, which means that he and Naomi are kin. And that is family. And that is something that is going to be important in the remaining chapters of this book of Ruth to know about him and Naomi being kin to one another. Now, Boaz will come into the picture in just a few more verses. I believe the author just wanted to set up for us the scene that portrayed Ruth meeting Boaz and who he was in relation to Naomi. Notice what verse 2 says. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose Sight, I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. So Ruth gains permission from Naomi to glean, to go out and glean the fields and try to get them some food. There's nobody else to do it for them. Their husbands are gone. There's no sons. And so Ruth has to pick up and go do it. Naomi is older. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how old she is. But Ruth is still of an age where she can get out and work in the fields and, and she has uh, the help to go and do that. But here is something that Ruth needed. She was hoping to find grace. What is grace? Grace is favor bestowed upon someone who doesn't deserve it 
and can't earn it. And so she was hoping for someone to show her some grace because she didn't deserve it. She knew it. She was a Moabite woman. And she didn't have no way to earn it. She simply was looking for somebody to show her some grace. She needed the grace. She needed the favor. She needed the kindness of a landowner who would allow her to glean in his fields or take the leftovers after the reapers would come and reap the harvest. Now here's the thing. God had a system worked out. You might call it God's welfare system in those days and time for those who were poor or those who were going through a hard time. He had a way set up where they could still eat and have food provided for them. It was the law that we find in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Listen to what Leviticus chapter 19 verse 9 and 10 says. Leviticus 19 verse 9 and 10. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I, the Lord, am your God. So here's the thing about it. We think about Ruth being poor and she asked us to go glean in the field. The, uh, the field that the farmers or the landowners would have, their reapers would go through, but they were not to go back and get the leftovers. Whatever they missed, it was to be left with the poor and the stranger. They were not to take the whole field, but they would sort of make a, a round circle and an oval shape and leave the corners for the poor so they could have something it was a great system set up by God to provide for those who were less fortunate, who had no way to earn an income and so a food could be gathered for them. Listen to what Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22 says. Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. And when thou cuttest down thy harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheep in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger for the fatherless and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. And so Ruth was hoping for some grace. The reason she needed the grace is perhaps all landowners didn't obey the law of God. There are a lot of sinners in the land. There are a lot of times. Remember they were living in the times of the judges where everyone did what was right in their eyes instead of following the whole word of God. And so she was hoping to land uh, upon someone's field that would allow her to gather the food that was needed. And so sometimes people, they didn't follow the law, they treated the women harshly. Sometimes would even abuse them. And so she needed some grace. She was hoping to find someone that would grant her access to a field to get enough food to feed her and Naomi for a day, for two days, hopefully for a week. And so she would go and look and, and maybe uh, someone would be kind enough to show her that grace because something else stands out. She was a foreigner. She wasn't one of them. She wasn't an Israelite woman. She was a Moabite woman. And being a woman from Moab made it even more difficult. But I tell you, things were looking up because now the famine was over. Food was easily being provided for by the farmers and the poor who had no substantial income, they were allowed to go and glean in the fields to gather for their homes. And so it was a wonderful time for Ruth. Now look at verse three. It says in Ruth chapter two, verse three, and she went and came and gleaned in the field 
after the reapers. And her hat was to light on a part of the field belonging to unto Boaz, who is of the kindred of Elimelech. The Bible says of Ruth, her hat was to light upon the field belonging unto Boaz, who is of the kindred of Elimelech. Ruth happened to come to the field that belonged to a relative of her mother-in-law's. She didn't know this. She didn't know the relationship of Boaz and Naomi. The word hap means by chance. She happened upon it. Happenstance. By chance. We might say as luck would have it. She went to the field that belonged to Boaz. We might say, what a coincidence. She went to the field that was owned by Boaz. But do you really, really believe that was a coincidence? Do you really believe that was luck? Do you really believe it was by accident that root happened upon the field which belonged to Boaz? I do not. I believe it was the hand of God Amen. directing her steps. I believe it was the providence of God. Amen? Are you listening to me? Amen. Nothing with God happens by accident. Amen. It's all by God's providence. Amen? I believe you that are here listening today, you didn't just wake up and say, I think I'll go to church today. I don't believe for one moment those watching us right now on Facebook woke up this morning and said, I think I'll check out Old Slope Baptist Church service this morning and see what's going on. I believe it was the providence of God that had led you here because he's got a message for each and every one of us. If we would just listen, allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, God will speak to our hearts what we need for this day. Amen? Amen. Now notice what verse 4 says. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. You can normally tell a lot about a person when you first hear them speak. And Boaz's first words that we hear tell us a lot about this man. Listen to what his first words were. Again. The Lord be with you. Talking to all of his workers in the fields. And they answered, the Lord bless thee. This was a man of faith who believed in God and loved his employees. Amen. Now, isn't it wonderful to see the respect that Boaz has for those that work for him and the love and respect that the workers have for their boss man, their landowner, their master. And so he asks the Lord's presence upon them, the Lord be with you. May God be with you all this day. And they in return said, the Lord bless you. Oh, that we all could have workplaces like this. Amen. Amen. Some of our workplaces are filled up with devilish people. But we all desire to have a workplace, a boss man like Boaz, and employees like the workers in his field. Wouldn't it make work more enjoyable if we all could have a place like we see Boaz and his workers having? See, tomorrow... You could be the very one to get it started. If you're a boss man, you could go to your employees tomorrow and say, the Lord be with you today. And if you are an employee, you could go to your boss and other employees and say, the Lord bless you this day. You could be the very one to change the atmosphere of your work site. It was a wonderful atmosphere with Boaz and all of his employees. It would make work so much more enjoyable. It would make dealing with stress uh, uh, a lot less stressful if we would simply give the Lord the glory and honor he deserves. Amen? Amen. But then look in verses 5 through 7. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, 
his foreman. Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and have continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So Boaz looks out upon the field, checking all his workers out, blessing them, and just checking to see how things are going. And guess what catches his eye? A beautiful young woman. And I could hear him say to himself, be still, my beating heart. <laughs> wow. Whose damsel is this? He went to look over his fields, but it turns out he begins looking over Ruth. She's a looker. She catches his attention, and he wants to know more about her. He was totally smitten by her. I believe it's what we call love at first sight. Now get this. Ruth happens to land upon the field to glean some food for her Ruth upon a man called Boaz who is kin to Naomi. He, after his business in Bethlehem is over, happens to come to the same portion of the field that Ruth is in, and he begins taking notice of Ruth. <clears throat> and he cannot take his eyes off of her. Nothing by God is ever by coincidence. Amen. It doesn't happen by accident. It is a divine appointment. It is the providence of God that Ruth and Boaz was to meet on this day. Now, just what is providence? Well, the, the, the dictionary writer says that providence is the protective care of God. The protective care of God. Some people think that things just happen in their lives, and by chance, a stroke of luck, by coincidence, instead of realizing it was the providential hand of God that was laid upon them. I heard a story one time of a cowboy who applied for health insurance, of all things. As the agent was making his way through a rather marathon list of questions, he asked the cowboy, have you ever been in any accidents? The cowboy replied, no. None that I can recall. I was bitten last year by a rattlesnake and a horse kicked me in the ribs. That laid me up for a little while. The agent responded rather with a confused look on his face. Wouldn't you call those accidents? No, said the cowboy. They both meant to do it. It was on purpose. <laughs> Ruth's story teaches us there are no accidents with God. It was on purpose. God bringing these two together. Everything has a reason. Now many of us can identify with seemingly chance events that change the course of our future. Sometimes maybe it was an unexpected encounter that led you to meet your husband or your wife. You might say, well, that was such a coincidence. That was a stroke of luck. We met by accident. No, I believe it was the providence of God Amen. that brought you together. Some people may have a conversation with someone that leads them into a career. Not just a job, but a career for your life. Some people say, well, I sure lucked out on that one. No, that was the providence of God. Maybe a friendship developed because uh, you were in a Bible study with someone or maybe on a work, in a work environment somewhere and you struck up a conversation and you believed you had something in common and now you're great friends. You might say, man, I met them by luck. It was just a chance meeting. No, I believe it was the providence of God 
that brought you a good close friend to be someone you could share things with. Sometimes we may think our faith grows stronger because we pick up a certain book or we happen to have a conversation with someone and we think, man, I was lucky to have that conversation. Or man, it was, it was by accident I picked up that book. No, I believe it was the providence of God that steered you in all of those ways to bring you to a spiritual fulfillment to be able to serve him in spirit and in truth. For whatever reason, what we think were coincidences, what we think were luck or, or accidents was God's providence. Listen to this. How many times have we been running late? We're panicking. We go out to the car and the car won't start. We have to get a jump or we have to keep trying until it jumps and it starts. Or maybe we got caught by a traffic light. We're already late. We don't need that traffic light to stop us. And we have to wait. And it's a long light. It's one of those lights that lasts for five minutes. And just about the time you get through the light, you, you know you're late, but, but you got to go. And just up the road ahead of you was an accident that took place. And if you'd have made it through that light, if your car had started when it's supposed to, you possibly couldn't have been involved in that accident. I think that's the providence of God working in our lives for our good. The meeting of Ruth and Boaz was not by chance. It was not by accident or luck or coincidence. It was the providence of God. Who is she? Who's damsel is she? In other words, what family does she belong to? The foreman relates her Moabite background, her relationship to Naomi. Then he recounts how she wanted to come in and glean the fields and how hard she has worked all morning long. Listen to verse 8 and 9. Then said Boaz to Ruth, he don't waste no time, does he? Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. And go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go to the vessels. And drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Boaz encourages her to stay in his field. He refers to her as daughter as a term of respect. Now, it is also feasible to think that she is much younger than him. But he refers to her with a term of respect, daughter. And he encourages her, don't glean in any of the other fields. Stay here in my field. Stay by my women who are working the fields. And know this, I've commanded the young men to show utmost respect to you and not to danger you in any way or, or make you uncomfortable. And when you are thirsty, come drink of the water that is drawn by the young men. She is gone from being in the back of the pack to being now with the rest of the workers. He's included her in with his folks that are working the field. So Boaz is telling Ruth, in effect, you don't need to go anywhere else. I will provide for you. I will protect you. You will not lack for anything if you'll just stay in this field. Look at verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground. And said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, see that I am a stranger? Ruth bows down, showing respect and honor to the landowner. But she's got a question. And she asks him outright, Why are you being so kind to me? I'm not one of your women. I'm a Moabite woman. I'm a foreigner. 
Ruth must have asked a question that was on everybody else's mind in the field when they saw their boss man treating her with such respect. Everyone must have been in shock. Boaz is bending over backwards for Ruth, no less a foreigner. He's the owner. He's wealthy. Ruth is at the bottom of the rung of the ladder of society. She is a Moabitess. She is poor. She has no family. Why? Why is Boaz treating her with such kindness? Well, he answers. Listen to verse 11 and 12. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done to thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and are coming to a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Boaz said, well, you're the talk of the town. Everybody's talking about what you've done. Now, I know she's got a puzzled look, so what do you mean? Because anyone who does something out of their heart doesn't expect to receive any recognition. Amen. They're doing it out of love of their heart. And so what Naomi had done, uh, rather what Ruth had done for Naomi, was out of a heart of love. But Boaz said, you're the talk of the town. He answers her, it's because of your devotion to Naomi. I've heard how you have stuck with her through thick and thin. Your decision to stay with her. Your decision to be with her family will be your family. Her God will be your God. And I pray a blessing upon you. And this is what he says. The Lord pay you back for all the work you're doing. A full reward be given from the God of Israel. And catch this now, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Boaz tells her, I believe you have made God your God and I know that you trust him because your works prove your faith. <coughs> we don't work to get saved. We work because we are saved. Amen. Amen. And we want to prove our love to God because of what he's bestowed upon us. Boaz realizes that Ruth has come to accept God as her God, Naomi and her people as her people, and he has the utmost respect, admiration, and dedication that he can give to Ruth because of what she has done for Naomi. That's why he's treated her so well. Because of what she has done for Naomi. And the words got out. They're talking about it. Look at verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. Ruth is comforted by his kindness. She hopes to continue to find favor in his sight and kindness even though she's not one of them. She's being treated as one of them. Look in verse 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat. And was sufficed or filled and left. Now that's a wonderful verse right there. He took her to, to uh, Olive Garden and got her some food. Amen. <laughs> he continues to show kindness toward her and said, When, when mealtime comes, you come join us. She's not just someone in the back, a poor person looking just to get the leftovers. He's now invited her to get what she can gather right behind the reapers, and now she is inviting her to a meal. Took her to the Olive Garden. 
parched corn, all the bread and olive oil you can eat, man, it's great. You know. Notice she's eating with everyone else. She's a part of it. He has made it so. He's made it so. You could say this was their first date. Mm -hmm. Hmm? He took her out. He grilled for her. Parts corn. Get this now. Here's the master, the landowner of all the field, inviting the lowest of the low to sit at his table. And he himself is serving her. He is serving her. She has become his honored guest. Do you see that? Ruth is the honored guest at the table of Boaz. Look at verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> Let me back up 14. Look at the last part. It's going to mean something in a few more verses. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and these she did eat and was sufficed or filled to all she could eat and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. And let her fall also some of the handfuls, or let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field unto even and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. <coughs> and so Boaz furthermore gives instructions to his young men concerning Ruth. And this is what he says. Let her glean among the sheaves without reproach. In other words, don't embarrass her. Let her get whatever she wants. Take back home to Naomi. Whatever she desires, don't embarrass her. Don't reproach her. He purposely says, let the stalks, good stalks, let some of them fall along behind you once in a while so she can have some great stuff to take home. Not just the leftovers, but some of the prime food. Let her be able to take some of that. So once in a while, drop a stalk behind you and let it be untouched. And then it says she was allowed to reap an ephah, which is about 30 to 50 pounds of barley in that day. That was a rather large amount to gather, especially for a young woman to carry. But she gathered up and she put it in her back sack and she was carrying that load around. What a wonderful blessing. A normal day's meal will consist of about two pounds of barley, we are told. And Ruth walks away with 30 to 50 pounds. Ain't God good? Amen. You know, when I was cropping tobacco, I used to sing through the fields. I'd sing, uh, He Didn't Come Down. I'd sing all kinds of songs. Once in a while, I'd sing a country song. Charlie Rich, hey, did you happen to see the most beautiful girl in the world? I'd sing how Jesus loved me and what he did for me. But when Naomi had sent Ruth in, she had no idea what was going to happen that day. And now here Ruth is. She's gathering the food. She's met the master. He has shown her kindness. He has shown her favor. He has supplied the grace that she asked for before she even left. And now I believe she's singing too. Ain't God good? To give us so many blessings undeserving. That's what we are. We ought to thank him. Love and praise him a little more today. A whole lot for tomorrow. Amen. Oh, I can see her singing in her heart how God has just opened the windows of heaven and poured out blessings upon her. Look at verse 18. And she took it up and went to the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. It ties into that previous verse 
where she sat down. And so at the end of the day, Ruth returns to the city with the 30 to 50 pounds. Of, how would you like to lug around 30 to 50 pounds? You talk about the original Wonder Woman. I can hear the theme song playing in my mind right now. And so she takes that food home. She lays it down at Naomi's peak. And boy, they're having a rejoicing time. Amen. And she came home. Get this now. With what she had, had left over as well. She took a take home box from her lunch. And took it home as well. As well as what she had picked out of the fields. She took that take home box home with her as a gift. Look at verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where walkest thou? Blessed be he that did take notice of knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Naomi asked Ruth, Whose field did you go to to be able to get this much food in one day? May that man be blessed. You asked for grace for you left for whoever would allow you to go in their field and God has supplied that blessing. God has supplied that grace. And as she begins to question Ruth about her day, I can see old bitter Naomi returning to old pleasant Naomi filled with joy for the great fortune that has fallen their way. And here's the thing. Who allowed you? Naomi knew she had kin in the area. Ruth didn't. She had no idea what Boaz meant to Naomi. And she says his name was Boaz. I can see Naomi's mouth drop. I can see her raising her hands. Praise be the Lord. Because two things they needed more than anything was food and family to help them through. And God was providing it. God's provision was being met through those ladies. Nobody's about to have a cow, I tell you. She's praising the Lord and she hears it's Boaz and she begins rejoicing. <coughs> Look at verse 20. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who have not left off kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinsmen. She praises the Lord, says, He's our kinfolk. And she <coughs> asked the Lord to bless him, to bless him tremendously. Look at verses 21 through 23. And Ruth the Moabite said, he said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men, until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Ruth tells Naomi of her day, now the Boaz said, you stay by my women and you'll be safe. I have commanded the young men not to harm you, but to watch out for you as well. And he encourages her to come back to his field every time she comes for food. Now think about this. We don't know how much she gleaned day after day. It would take probably three months for the harvest to be gathered in completely. But as she gathered what she gathered in that one day, God supplied them with a year's supply of food. Ain't God good? Amen. 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 Now, in today's story, what can we learn from it? We can learn that God uses the provisions of the Israelite law, handed down years and years and years earlier, to be able to meet Ruth and Naomi's need in their time. And so Boaz is seen as the great provider. Boaz is the one who feeds and meets the needs of both Ruth and Naomi. Boaz is symbolic. 
He's a picture. He's a type of what God does for you and for me. Can you see it through the whole story we read? How Boaz is looking at the root is the way God looks after you and me. God provides for our needs many times over in many different ways as well. God is our great provider. God is our sustainer. He cares for us and he loves us like no one else ever will. Amen. Amen. Boaz treats Ruth as family, though at best she's a distant relative. Through Boaz, God's care for Naomi and Ruth has a face. Boaz is being used by God. Just like Jesus uses you and me to reach out to people and be a blessing to them as well. And so we see how God is using Boaz. He becomes the face of God to reach out to Ruth and Naomi. As Boaz shows grace and kindness to someone who's undeserving, <coughs> don't you know that we have a God who has shown so much love, mercy, and grace to you and me, who is undeserving, there's none righteous, no, not one. But God in his mercy, in his love, and in his grace reaches out to you and me and provides for us. Amen? Even though we're all undeserving. As God gives a harvest, we have the opportunity to share in that harvest with other people. When God meets our physical needs, we need to be used of God to meet others' physical needs. There's others less fortunate than what we are. And we need to be like Boaz and reach out to people and show them God's love through us. Amen? Amen. Through such encounters, God reminds us that Jesus came into this world to be our Savior, to be our kinsman, so he can redeem us from the curse of the law. What we see in Boaz is a picture of what Jesus Christ is in his love, his care, his protection, and his provision for all those to come to him. Boaz's field was already ready. Ruth came into it and received what was already there. God's love, mercy, and grace is already ready. <coughs> All you and I need to do is walk up into it and receive it for ourselves. He's provided it if only we would receive it. As Boaz humbled himself to serve Ruth, Jesus Christ has humbled himself on the cross of Calvary to die for our sins, every one of us. The Master, our Lord, let heaven's glory come to earth's gloom to die on earth's cross for your sin and for my sin. And that was what Boaz is showing us. Christ has come to humble himself as Boaz humbled himself. Do you know him today in a personal relationship? I pray that you do. Because if not, you're truly missing out. Amen. You're missing out on a wonderful Savior. Amen. A wonderful Lord who wants and desires to take care of us in our needs. Today as we extend this invitation, would you come? Maybe, maybe you don't need salvation. Maybe you simply want to come and thank God for his provision. How he's provided for you. For your family. Maybe you want to come and pray for someone else that's in need. Just maybe you want to come and pray to get back in a right relationship. Your joy is gone. And you want that joy back. And just maybe it is what you need. Salvation. Would you come receive Jesus today? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Our Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, as we extend this invitation, I pray as you have searched our hearts, the Holy Spirit would move us and beckon us to respond the way that you would be pleased. And you would speak to our hearts and we would receive what we need in this invitation. As we come to you, it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.
couple who has been visiting our church for several months now. May have been over a year. Not quite sure. But several months. Yeah. But Ken and Nancy Stanley. And they desire to move their membership with our church. It's over at Mountain Grove Church in Connolly Springs Road, Granite Falls, North Carolina. So what's the pleasure of the church? So we have a motion. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those likewise, so carried. Amen. Amen. So we appreciate <laughs> Any testimonies, any comments when we close out? Y'all just stay right here. Amen. All right. Now, this is unusual. Just come by and wave at them or fist bump them. I don't know how close they want people to be, but just let them know you acknowledge them and love them and we'll be praying for them. Welcome them to our church family, okay? Well, that's me. Brother Albert, would you close us in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this another opportunity to come to your house. Father, we thank you for the message today. We thank you, uh, Lord, for those that joined this morning. And, uh, Father, we just thank you again for Blessings you bestow upon us that we take for granted every day. Help us to take something from this message today that we can carry with us out the upcoming week and uh, days ahead. Lord, we thank you for your word that we have to read and to study. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your house. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your house. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your house. 